I'm a mathematician. Uh, I've been a mathematician since I was so high. So high. Uh, but I've also been a business person since I was just a little bit shorter than that. I have run all sorts of businesses throughout uh, my career. My first business was a zoo. Uh, I then had a, an amusement arcade. I had a newspaper, a school newspaper that never came out. I've had all sorts of businesses. Um, and they've, they have affected the way I think, the way I apply mathematics in my day-to-day -day job as a, as a quant. I am a quant. I still run lots of different businesses. Um, I, I run something that competes with the OU. I have the CQF.com, the Certificate in Quantitative Finance. Uh, it, I also have Wilmot.com, one L and two Ts. It's free to join. It's a discussion forum for people in quantitative finance. I'm here going to talk about my experiences of being a quant, but as someone who very much has at least one foot in the real world. And we were just saying before, um, downstairs, we were just discussing the, the sort of perfect background for, some, for an economist. And really, the perfect background for an economist should be someone who has perhaps run a corner shop, somebody who has real experience of how the markets and human beings work. And that's certainly not been the case in quantitative finance. People typically go from, uh, say, a degree in physics, engineering, mathematics, and become a quant without having gone through the real world at all. So I'm going to go through some of my experiences of, uh, some notes here, some experiences of how people, how mathematicians in finance uh, think and how it is kind of lacking in some reality. Hence the, the book learning versus street smart thing. Now, I've been a quant since the, the, the mid-1980s. And when I started out, it was, it was very unfashionable to, to work in finance within a, what was a, a university maths department. In fact, university maths departments in the UK did not know anything about, um, about finance, that mathematics could be applied to finance. We all assumed that people working in finance just had very loud pinstripe suits and drank champagne for lunch. They didn't, we didn't realize that actually there is mathematics. Uh, so when I got into it, I was the, the first person in my university in the maths department who'd ever done any mathematical finance. Um, so I'd, I hadn't any real world experience of that, but I knew how, you know, how markets worked. And so I was doing, doing some research, and I was reading up papers. And one of the first things that shocked me was when I started to work on interest rate modeling. Now, interest rate modeling is not very difficult at all. Um, you write down some equations for um, how you think interest rates evolve through time. Typically, you assume randomness. You, you, your model typically has uh, is a bit like rolling a dice. Interest rates going up and going down is like a rolling of a dice. Very simple sort of models. And you get it leads on to models for how does the yield curve behave, um, how you can value complex financial derivatives. So reading through these papers, it, as a math, somebody who likes uh, applying mathematics to all sorts of things, uh, interesting, I got to the, a point in, in one paper, a very famous paper by um, a gentleman called Vazicek, where he writes down a kind of general framework for a mathematical model in, in interest rates. And then he says, uh, I'm going to take an example. So he, he has a general framework, and then he takes an example. And what he means by taking an example, he's, he assumes something about how he, interest rates behave. And the reason in this paper that he makes this assumption is so that the equations that he's got, he can solve them on a piece of paper. Right? He can write down the solution, a nice closed-form analytic solution. Had he chosen some other model, then he would have had to solve things numerically. I thought, this is very strange. What? OK, OK, so it's a research paper. He wanted to draw some pictures. He wanted some numbers. He wanted to illustrate some ideas. But then I discovered people in the real world were using this model, this model that he had just as an example, because he didn't want to do, you know, he, he wasn't a programmer. He couldn't solve a general, the general model. He couldn't solve a realistic problem. He had to do it with pencil and paper. But billions of dollars were going through this man's model and it was just a model, it was an example. 
That is very strange. I mean, you, do, you, you don't do that in any other field. I used to work in fluid mechanics before, um, before the quantitative finance. And there we have very famous equations called the, the Navier-Stokes equations and the Euler equations. These are for conservation of momentum and conservation of mass. The idea is you can apply basic physics principles like Newtonian mechanics and get an equation. So these equations are then solved by computer and help you design airplanes. Nobody who designs airplanes says, oh, you know what, these equations are so complicated, I think I'll, I'll simplify them. And then I'll design an airplane based upon these simplified equations. Nobody does that, because your planes would fall out of the sky. But still, billions of dollars are going through these simple models, which are really just an example at the end of some research paper. So that was shocking. That was shocking. And then as I did more research, I became a bit cynical. I remember um, writing two papers at around about the same time. They're both to do with transaction cost modeling. When you're buying and selling um, assets, you lose some money because you know, bid offer spread. And I did these two bits of work with two different groups of people. And one of the groups had a very famous, um, we had a co-author who was very famous, but the model was not very realistic. The other paper, the other piece of research, it was just me and a student. And the model was really, really good. And I said to the student, I said, you know which one is going to be accepted? Is it going to be the really good model with just you and me? Or is it going to be the really bad model with the famous person? And of course, you know the answer. It was a, it was a really bad one with the famous person that got published first. Then, then, I, then I moved on to... Um, something to do with complex financial products and, and how traders um, see these, these products. And I, I did some research with a very good uh, postdoc of mine, Young Suk On, and we submitted it to the Journal of Finance. Now, the Journal of Finance is the number one journal in the world, Journal of Finance, for anything to do with finance, anything to do with derivatives, um, options. We submitted it. And we had a hell of a time with the referees. They basically, they didn't read the paper. They read the first paragraph, completely misunderstood what we were doing. Uh, so we kept re re rewriting it to try and you know, explain it like the editor was a four-year-old, so that sort of approach. Still, they just couldn't get beyond the first paragraph. Completely misunderstood. So I, I, we gave up, we gave up. I actually started my own journal just to publish that paper. No, not really. But I did start a journal, but not for that reason. And then I did, I did the thing we, we do a lot these days. I thought, I'll do a little bit of um, research on the Journal of Finance. This Journal of Finance, which everybody worships, 97% um, of the or people who get published in the Journal of Finance are white males from American universities. Uh, and I'm, I'm white. I'm, I'm very male, actually. Um, but I wasn't from an American university. So no chance, 3% chance of getting published. And so it, there's a very strange, strange things going on within the whole financial world. You've got, you've got kind of, I won't call it corruption, but you've got sort of an old boy network. You've got people who use coming up with models just because they're, they're simple and they don't like programming. We have the problem where you have the professor comes up with a model, and the professor doesn't understand the markets. And his sole goal, the professor who's coming up with a, with a mathematical model, is to impress other professors. He doesn't care at the slightest about whether his model is realistic, whether it's dangerous. He just wants to impress his peers, which I think is a sad kind of way to go through life. But uh, I've never tried to impress anyone, as you can probably tell. Um, and then you've got the, the traders and the quants in banks who are using these models. They don't necessarily understand what the professor knows about his model. They, they just implement them. It's funny, though, because there's so much money goes through banks that really, it's the, you could almost say it's, like it's an incentive issue. The people are going to make money. If you're a quant in a bank, you're going to make money regardless of whether your models are any good or not. Um, it's a perverse system. So actually, as long as you just keep your nose clean and don't get fired, you're going to get a big bonus at the end of the year. A couple of years, 
you'll you know, be able to retire to the south of France with a nice big yacht as long as you keep your nose clean. Just do the same as everybody else. Don't rock the boat. Don't try and come up with any fancy new model. Um, there's some great models out there. Russell is going to talk, um, or mention shortly, about the concept of uncertainty versus risk. Um, risk is what quants do. They look at risk. They, they, they love abstract probability theory. But they don't understand there are more interesting things, a way of representing what's going on in the world. Like uncertainty, I won't go into the details, but there's a difference between randomness and uncertainty. They sound kind of familiar. Mathematicians love randomness, but they can't cope with uncertainty. Um, there's an example I can give that, that um, if, you, if you go to, if you've done a course, I don't know what it's like in the, uh, the Masters of Finance at the OU, but You'll hear a lot about um, portfolio theory, diversification. You know, you, you taught the idea that uh, you must spread, spread your risk amongst lots of different products. Find things that are uncorrelated so, so that you're not exposed to any particular sector, for example. That's the theory. The theory says that. But the minute you join a bank, suppose you've... you've You've been to the University of Chicago, where all these famous Nobel Prize winning idiots come from. You go to the University of Chicago, and you learn all about modern portfolio theory, about how to spread the risk amongst diversified products. And then you get a job in a bank. Now, you imagine it's your first day, a job in a bank. You're being introduced. You're going around the desks. And you find this desk. What do you do? Oh, you, you trade CDOs. That's interesting. You go to the next desk. And you trade. Oh, you do CDOs as well. You go around all the desks. You find everybody's doing the same trades. I think that's really weird. That's pretty strange. But why aren't you diversifying? Hmm. Anyway, so you come from the University of Chicago. You've got some great trading ideas. And you think that you've got some better trade possibilities than all these people. Let's do some mathematics, some basic mathematics. Let's suppose that all of you are trading CDOs. And really, it's a coin toss. It might as well be a coin toss. You're going to get a bonus at the end of the year if you make money. And if you lose money... Nothing happens. So you might as well just toss a coin. Me, I've got, I reckon I've got a really good trade. I reckon I've got a trade that's 75% likely to make money. Okay? So you're all playing a coin tossing game. 50-50 whether you make money or not. Me, I've got 75% chance of making money. Now, how am I personally going to get a big bonus? If I do my trade... You might think, oh, 75% 75, 75 chance of making money, therefore 75% chance of getting a big bonus. But no. If you guys all toss a coin and you get tails en masse, then the bank goes bust. Or there's, nobody's going to get a bonus. I'm not going to get a bonus. I'm the only person who made money. But my bonus depends on you as well. So actually, the probability of me getting a bonus is 50% to you getting heads times 75%. So 37.5% chance of me getting a bonus. That's if I do the decent, honest thing of trying to diversify. But actually, the sensible thing to do is I'll just join your, your desk. And I'll stop you know, trading CDOs. Because then I've got a 50% chance of getting a bonus. So in practice, there's actually no reason to do what the, business, the, uh, the finance professors tell you to do. So there's a big difference between reality and theory. Very big difference. And that's, that's really all about incentives. Bonuses are terrible things. Um, another thing that you don't get where finance goes wrong is you don't have non-linearity. The world is very non-linear. Now, what I mean by that is if you go to your corner shop, right, the corner shop with the you know, budding economics professor working there, and you say that you want to buy 100 bottles of beer, now, a bottle of beer is one pound. 100 bottles of beer, how are you going to pay for 100 bottles of beer? Well, according to basic economics theory, it'll be 100 pounds, because 100 times one is 100. But, of course, the, the guy behind the counter knows, you know, gosh, he needs 100 bottles of beer. It could, well, it could go one of, it could go one of several ways. It could be, it could be 100 pounds. Or it could be, uh, oh, yes, sir, you know, you're a valued customer, going to give you a 20% discount, so it's only going to be £80. Pounds. Or it could be, 
oh, 100 bottles of beer, sorry, I've, you know, I've put this, this crate aside for somebody else. Oh, it's going to cost you, sorry, you know, I don't want to upset my, my other best customer. It's going to cost you 150 pounds. Now, none of that is in quant finance. There's almost no non-linear thing. If you have a CDO that's got a profit of $1,000, well, just do it 1,000 times. It's a million dollars. Multiply by 1,000. You're going to make a billion dollars profit. Again, trillion, quadrillion, whatever. Just scale things up. You're going to make more and more money. There's no concept of, well, eventually, the market becomes so big that the tail starts wagging the dog. Look at the, the derivatives market now. The derivatives market <coughs> is, is something like 1.2 quadrillion dollars in financial derivatives. Now, the, the GDP of the planet is... 50 trillion or something like that, but that's a, that's a big difference between, basically, the reason why people have got those corner shops is just to keep the financial markets afloat. That's all that they're doing. Um, no, it is, there's problems at absolutely every level. Um, for example, the, um, a few years ago, this was after the financial crisis, I was called in to... Um, speak to some people not far from this, this building, um, some treasury thing. They, they, were, they wanted to speak to experts in quant finance about uh, high-frequency trading, algorithmic trading, the computers taking over the markets. I was called in because they, they wanted to speak to various experts, and apparently I was one of them, about their opinions on, um, on the direction of, of um, high-frequency trading. Was it going to destabilize the market? It, it must have been after, um, was it May the 10th? Was it May the 10th or May the 6th? It was, it was May 2010. Um, it was the same day as the uh, general election. Um, in the US, there was this thing called the flash crash. Okay, it was the first flash crash. And what happened with the flash crash was Stocks like um, was it Arthur Anderson went from whatever they were down to five cents. Uh, ten minutes or so later, they bounced back. But as it was going down, well, who, who sells Arthur Anderson, say, 20 cents, you know, when it was many dollars beforehand? Anyway, the computers partly blamed for this flash crash. Uh, I was too busy watching the general election, so I, 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 missed, I missed the excitement. Um, and so the, the, this... this, this Treasury uh, committee thing that, that I was asked to speak to, they have this thing called foresight reports. And what they do on all sorts of topics, you know, global warming, plastic bags, etc., but also uh, computer aided um, trading. They wanted me to tell them, you know, to, they wanted to anticipate problems that might happen because of high frequency trading. And so I said, well, I mean, you know, I'm sort of on the fence. There are good things and bad things about it. But um, the bad things are, um, well, people always talk about liquidity. Oh, it's great to have all these, these computers trading because then you get lots more liquidity in the market and that means the you know, man or woman in the street, they can sell their shares and it's only going to cost them one cent to trade these shares. It's, you know, a vast improvement in transaction costs. Well, I say, yeah, that's, that's fine, but if it's going to cost, cause a stock market crash, they've just lost half, lost half their pension. It's no good saying that they saved one cent on some trades that they, they, don't, they don't trade anyway. So, stupid, you know. Um, so I said there was, there was that issue. Um, there was also the issue of now the computers were, were they were just looking at the numbers. They, 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 your, your classic high-frequency trader doesn't care about what the stock does or the fact that the company employs people. All they care about is what, what does the stock been doing over the last three minutes? Because they're going to trade over periods of milliseconds. So they, they look at patterns in the last few milliseconds of trades, and they buy and sell. You lose all connection between any concept of value for this stock and the price. Now, value and price are different. You get, speak to the, the, um, the man in the corner shop. He knows the difference between value and price. With price, he tries to sell it for as much as he can, or he tries to optimize his profit. The value? Well, he knows how much it costs him to buy the product, how much it costs him rent of the corner shop, etc. There's a difference between value and price. 
So all sorts of reasons why high-frequency trading might be dangerous. So I wrote a little report for them saying um, I wasn't, you know, I was a bit worried about high-frequency trading. Oh, I should have said, when they were sort of wooing me for this, this panel, they sent me a draft copy of all of the experts they'd spoken to, or were going to speak to. Okay, that's going to become important in a second. And I was on the list, obviously. So a year goes by. Two years go by, and I haven't heard from them. So I emailed the chap, and I said, what's happened to your foresight committee? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah it's going fine. It's going fine. Um, uh, but but um, we, uh, sorry we haven't been in touch, but we thought you were a little bit too academic. Um, OK, that's fine. I haven't been called that before, ever, actually, but that's fine. And then a year after that, the foresight report came out. Now, before it came out, I said to this, this bloke, I said, there are going to be various things that, that people will recommend that you do. One is, you know, in, in, in order to improve or s minimize the risk of high-frequency trading, one of those is the concept of, um, what are they called? The, 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 the trigger thing, the, um, the, the market's close, the break thing, whatever they're called. Um, breakers, circuit breakers, that's it. I bet you that hedge fund managers will love, if you recommend circuit breakers, hedge fund managers are going to love that because they can gain that very easily. I bet they can. Anyway, the report comes out. And you know what it says? It says, high frequency trading is fantastic. There's nothing to worry about at all. Um, it's great. We've, we've got nine suggestions. We had nine suggestions, but actually eight of them we're not going to bother with. But one that, that the, the people are saying well, might be a good idea is circuit breakers. So I sort of, it's very easy to read these people. That they, it may be difficult to model financial markets, but very easy to read these people. And then I went back, I looked at the, the panel, the, who was on the panel, who produced the final report, and I looked at the panel when it was first constructed, and all of the independent people, like me, all the independent academics and other people, they disappeared completely from the panel. And all that was left on the panel of people recommending what should happen about high frequency traders were hedge fund managers and the CEOs of exchanges. In other words, it had been, it had been rigged, conspiracy theory. It had been rigged to give the answer they wanted. They didn't want to risk high frequency trading. So at every possible level, whether it's governments or finance professors or students or researchers, the subject is mad. It says mad somewhere. Mad. And what we need is more smarts and less book learning.